ready. Jump, jump, jump. <laughs> in the hillsides overlooking the capital city of uh, Madagascar and it's a tongue twister. It's, I think I finally got it. It's Antananarivo or Antananariv, city of about two million. Where we are here in Madagascar is about as far as you can get from California and still be on planet Earth. It was, I think, about 36 hour transit. 24 hours of those were spent on an actual plane. Madagascar's growing population has put pressure on the environment. Since 1953, the country has lost half of its forest cover. This country is truly unique. I mean, it's a little larger than California, a little smaller than Texas, and yet its diversity is at a continental scale. It's, uh, it's an amazing place and 90% of it has already been lost. And what remains includes some of the most important ecosystems and species anywhere on Earth. 65 million years ago, Madagascar broke off from a prehistoric landmass, making it the world's oldest island. Its isolation spawned plants and animals that don't exist anywhere else on the planet, such as the pygmy mouse lemur and these giant trees known as baobabs. It's amazing. Never seen anything like this ever. These trees are just, they're weird looking. They're really, really weird looking. Century after century of deforestation for the purpose of rice farming and cattle grazing has destroyed the native ecosystem. The president has pledged to make environmental conservation the keystone of his administration. He's closing off entire swaths of forest from development and agricultural production. We traveled to one of the protected areas with Russ Mittermeier, head of Conservation International, to see what progress has been made. Watch your camera. Mittermeier has been instrumental to the country's new march toward conservation. Follow it straight back, you'll see a white ball of fluff back there. Straight up. He regularly seeks out new animal species hiding in the forests, and when he's successful, he takes those findings to the president, who then pledges to increase the areas of protection. When you can do something like this, bring an animal in that, uh, that really is, is threatened in most of its habitat, when you can put it back in a very secure place, it's, it's a huge success. And it's something that demonstrates that all of these conservation efforts pay off. This doesn't have, not only doesn't have legs, it doesn't have a face either. Russ was a bit like a kid in a candy store, and his mood was infectious. Not as big as the six-foot ones in Australia, but... <laughs> What's it look like when it un um, unfurls? It's just a, you haven't seen them. They, they live under garbage in the U.S., the little Stop. tiny ones. They're usually kind of a boring gray. Here they get quite big. And they're, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like yeah. The, they, they just crawl them? along. They're harmless. And then you touch them, and they just roll into little... But they're tiny. I mean, they're... We call, we call them roly-polies as a kid. That was the Madagascan equivalent of that. Much more colorful, a lot cooler looking. <laughs> Apparently there's a gecko somewhere on this branch. They challenged me to find it. <laughs> Not easy. Look for the eye. <laughs> oh, see that? It's right here. Like, hello. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the now you can tell it's now actually there, it. but you never know Still otherwise. Pretty well camouflaged. Yeah. <laughs> So this is all part of the uh, Andasi Bay Reserve, which is one of the largest reserves in the country. And it's opened up to ecotourism. This is one of the, uh, the ways the government here is trying to support conservation while also helping some of the local populations. Very bizarre looking bird. He should come closer. Oh, here he is, here he is. Look, 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 look. Perfect, perfect. You see him? Ecotourism here is still fairly new. Madagascar is looking at Costa Rica as one of the models for making ecotourism an important driver of the economy.
This is one of several eco lodges that have popped up recently to draw the growing number of tourists. Last year, Madagascar saw a 13% increase in the number of visitors, and local people from a village nearby work as guides in the park, bringing much needed income to their communities. Ecotourism is providing locals the opportunity to benefit from the nation's rich biodiversity, which in turn helps benefit the forests by ensuring that they're not cut down. People come in Madagascar uh, to visit the forest, and uh, I think uh, because of the lemurs, we have uh, 99 uh, species of lemurs here, and I think it's one of the what interest of uh, people in the world to come. Look! This is Lemur Island. This is the, uh, the big highlight of, uh, of any trip to Madagascar. Um, of course, they're significant because they don't exist anywhere else. They're called prosimians, right? Prosimians is a different group of primates from the monkeys and apes. You got basically the prosimians, and then you got the monkeys and apes, and us. Then you also have a little group called the tarsiers, which kind of fall between the... Whoa. <laughs> oh, my God. Tree, you know? <laughs> that... <laughs> we didn't expect I didn't, that, didn't, I didn't expect it so soon. <laughs> now, is there anything I should not be doing? Don't touch. Do Let not them touch. touch. Let you, them touch me. But don't touch them, because okay. any kind of grabbing is an act of aggression. And they have teeth like razor blades, like, you know, they're about this long. The fur against my neck here it just feels so soft and they're and they're very sensitive to very specific habitats these are mostly uh, intact rainforest animals these don't do well in, in degraded or degraded habitats mm. which is another problem because as the habitat gets destroyed they disappear <laughs> Jump. God, look at that. Come on, guys. <laughs> he usually Whoa. won't jump on you, but these others will. <laughs> <laughs> they really like you. Yeah. We got up early to look for the Indri, one of the park's most popular attractions. So we're on our way. We're on our way to go see the Indri, which is the largest lemur that's still in existence. And it looks, we're told, a bit like panda bear. Little brown, uh, little black and white patches. So it looks like uh, we may have found the injuries right about when they're starting to wake up. Uh, which is when they make these really eerie calls throughout the forest. See him up there? It's a little backlit, but he's in a pretty good position. He's coming down. He'll come down lower. I think. <laughs> the Indians are starting to do their territorial call every morning at different hours, depending on the time of the year. They'll do this long wailing call, the Song of the Indri, which is basically a territorial call that says, my group is here, you're there, let's stay away from one another. It's a very distinctive sound. Um, they're most often likened to whale-like sounds. This is unlike any other primate call. Uh, and these animals are bringing literally millions of dollars of revenue into Madagascar because these are among the most visited groups of primates on the planet. Definitely worth the uh, pains that it took to get here. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There are many great successes like this reserve. Lemurs and the many unique animals of Madagascar making a comeback. In this, one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. We got in the air to leave Andasi Bay, but I wasn't quite prepared for what we were about to see. 
Uh, the forest that you see ahead of us is the forest that we were in today. That's the special reserve where we saw the injuries. This is intact rainforest, primary rainforest. It's basically uh, about as good forest as you can get in Madagascar. Look ahead of you now and watch how it starts changing. It's kind of a compressed time sequence of what's happened to Madagascar over the past 20, 30, 50, 100 years. The forest gets more fragmented. You've got just tiny little pockets of natural vegetation and already the erosion is starting to, uh, to hit in a major way. And of course, once you have these huge erosion gullies, it's extremely difficult to restore this land to any kind of, uh, of productivity. It's just, you know, getting down almost to the bare rock. So land that's been eroded like this is almost worthless. It would cost hundreds of millions of dollars to bring this kind of land back in any significant way, if you could even do it. You're not going to get a whole lot more extreme than this anywhere in the world. As we're flying overhead, you're seeing um, a lot of the green that's broken up by patches of red. And uh, it looks like the planet is literally bleeding. Everywhere you go in Madagascar, you see rice. Archaeologists believe the first people to populate Madagascar originally traveled from Indonesia about 2,000 years ago, and with them came rice cultivation. Rice is a vital part of the culture here and the Malagasy people are, on a per capita basis, amongst the biggest consumers of rice in the world. As important as rice is to the culture, it also poses an interesting problem because most of the deforestation of this country is due to the fact that rice farmers have to slash and burn much of the forest in order to cultivate, uh, cultivate the rice. Slash and burn agriculture also known as Tavi, is how the rural poor survive. They cut and burn down the forests in order to clear the land for rice. You can see that small stack of smoke emanating from over there. That is, uh, that's an example of uh, what's going on here throughout the country. Just to kind of give you a sense of what this area used to look like, Look at this patch of uh, pretty intact forest over here. The only reason that hasn't been cut down is because it's a burial site. But if you look up on the hillsides, there's very, very little natural rainforest cover left. And, uh, you know, much of this is cut down for one or two seasons worth of, of farming and agriculture, and then it's abandoned and the villagers move on to another patch and deforest away. with some aid workers to a village outside the southern city of Fort Dauphin, where efforts were underway to provide alternatives to slash and burn. We're gonna go look at a small dam project. One of, the, one of the effects of stripping the hillsides of the natural rainforest cover is that you're destroying a watershed. And for the farmers here who obviously need water for the crops, a dam is a uh, much needed project here. So it's a small dam built with the communities yeah? and it will permit to irrigate something like uh, 24 hectares of rice field. Mm -hmm. They're hoping that with better agricultural practices and proper irrigation, the fields will remain productive year after year. And so the villagers won't need to resort to clearing more forest for the rice. Which has half a quart. Near the village, the soil is tired, you know. You need to put a lot of fertilizer, and we don't have money to, to that. But if you go very, uh, on the top of the forest, it's very easy to find good soil, because you just have to burn 
and to cultivate directly. The problem is after two or three years, the soil is destroyed, and he knows that. If you ask to people not to cut the forest, you have to give them other opportunity. And it's what we are doing here with making dam or developing other type of crops. If you make only conservation, conservation, at the end, you know, uh, everything will be a big museum, but with nobody inside. Walking back from the dam, we met men who had just returned from the forest. They were carrying wood that they were going to sell in Fort Dauphin. It's a big problem because they are cutting big, big piece of wood and they are not making slash and burn. They are going into the forest, which is remaining, and all the, the wood which have a value, they cut it. This, this piece is about more than three euros. That means it's a good income for him. Conservationists argue that the government should do more to protect the forest, but right now, most of it is up for grabs. Yeah. It's open bar. market here in town and it seems like every other stall is selling these giant sacks of blackened wood and what it is is charcoal. This is one of the main sources of fuel for families who are cooking. This woman is frying bananas and throughout this marketplace you can see food being cooked. They're being cooked with charcoal. Um, family of four can consume one of these large sacks in about two weeks or so because they use the charcoal to boil water to make rice and they eat rice three times a day so they go through these pretty quickly and this is uh, presenting a pretty substantial challenge to conservationists and anyone who's worried about the forest. We traveled out of the city along another one of Madagascar's famously bumpy roads to an area where the primary economic activity is making charcoal. Still trying to make our way up into the areas where the charcoal is being made. Um, a bit winded, it's hot, it's a steep climb, and people tell us that year after year they're having to go farther and farther away from their homes to find wood that they can use to, to make this charcoal. The forest is disappearing bit by bit. This is one of the spots where the wood is being prepared to burn and kind of bake into the charcoal. <laughs> Out of this one side, for example, they could draw 10 to 15 bags of charcoal. And how many trees is that? About 200, 200 so. trees. So the flames have been set. Uh, this entire oven essentially is uh, burning and baking the wood. And this area is just completely consumed with smoke. As people do this, Every day, uh, this is the only way they earn a living. The demand for trees to produce charcoal has placed pressure on one of the area's most amazing ecosystems, the spiny forest. when you thought Madagascar couldn't get any weirder looking or cooler looking for that matter, you're hit with another surprise. This is the spiny forest. And uh, like many other places in Madagascar, this feels like another world. I actually feel like I've been transported into like a Dr. Seuss book or something. There's like no surface area that you could touch without getting pricked by one of these things. 
when it's actually green it kind of kind of resembles a cactus but when you strip off the uh, outer bark and you can see that's actual like solid hardwood uh, the fact that these trees also are being cut down to make uh, wood for housing speaks to the uh, a level of uh, I guess the level of desperation um, it doesn't yield a lot of wood here but while local industrial practices such as charcoal production have taken their toll on the environment, modern industries can have an even greater impact. The rest of the world is starting to take interest in Madagascar's many natural resources, like timber, gems, and minerals. We noticed that this mountainside was being completely stripped of all vegetation and, and was being chipped away at as soon as we landed at the airport. This is part of a foreign-owned mining operation for Ilmenite, a mineral used in paint. The mining company promises to bring development and new jobs to the local economy. But so far, most of those jobs have gone to workers brought in from South Africa. Farmers have been removed from their land to make way for the operation. And even fishermen have lost their jobs due to the construction of a new port related to the mine. We just happened upon a group of fishermen who are waiting for compensation from the mining project because they've been prohibited from fishing in, in certain areas. They spoil our life and way of lives and way of living because we can no more fish. We are here just waiting for our money because we, we cannot work. The waters will be off limits to fishermen for almost three years. As compensation, they'll be paid around 85 US dollars a month an amount they say is too little to live off. It's far from being enough, but uh, we accept it or not. It's either you take the money or, or, or zero. Yeah, or zero. Madagascar is, uh, is rich in natural resources and foreign countries and companies are starting to see that. What kind of challenge does that pose? Now China is, is uh, you know, is looking for uh, materials, and uh, we have minerals all over the world. And now with this very big demand of China, everything is uh, growing, uh, growing up, and all the mining projects which appears in Madagascar coming directly because of that. All the work ecologists have done for a long time will be destroyed. You know, it's difficult to resist when you have so big amount of money. Yeah. Do you think this government can resist? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This mining project has to be managed in, in a sense that the money which will be created has to be shared with everyone. We have to find a way to spread this money and to create new type of sustainable activities. We came out here because we saw that Tavi was taking place, um, trees were burning, and we can still see some of the smoke and some of the flames. And we were talking about how, how beautiful it is here. Which seems kind of wrong to say because so much of this area has just been completely wiped out. Um, really, there are only just pockets of, of forest left. There's an increased demand with an increased uh, population and and an economy that's slowly on the rise. The environmental demands that are going to be on this country are going to be huge. If the deforestation continues at its pace, all may be lost within uh, the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's hard to imagine. See more Vanguard Wednesdays at 10 p.m. on Current or online at current.com slash Vanguard.